Understanding the role of the Holy Spirit is fundamental in Reformed theology, as it encapsulates the dynamic presence and activity of God within the believer's life and the extensive church community. Reformed theology places a significant emphasis on the sovereignty of God, and the Holy Spirit's work is an essential aspect of this divine governance. The Holy Spirit is not merely an abstract force, but the third person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Son, actively involved in creation, redemption, and sanctification. The Spirit's role extends from the initial act of regeneration, whereby a sinner is brought to new life in Christ, to the ongoing process of sanctification, where believers are progressively conformed to the image of Christ. This essay aims to explore these multifaceted roles of the Holy Spirit, grounding our comprehension in the biblical foundation laid out in both the Old and New Testaments, examining the theological framework that Reformed thinkers have constructed, and considering the practical implications for contemporary Christian living. By delving into Scripture, we will see how the Holy Spirit was present and active in the creation narrative, how the prophets foretold His outpouring, and how His work was fully manifested in the New Testament, particularly at Pentecost. Theologically, we will unpack the Spirit's personhood, His roles in creation, providence, revelation, and His crucial involvement in the believer's journey of faith. Additionally, we will consider the cessationist viewpoint, which posits that certain miraculous gifts ceased with the apostolic age, accentuating the Spirit's continuing work in non-miraculous ways. Finally, this essay will provide practical guidance on living by the Spirit, affirming how the Spirit empowers prayer, worship, and daily obedience. By discerning the Holy Spirit's comprehensive role, believers can develop their relationship with God and live more fully under His guidance and power. First of all, the Holy Spirit's presence and activity are integral to the biblical account, bringing a base for figuring out His role in Reformed theology. From the opening verses of Genesis to the culmination of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is depicted as the potent and life-giving presence of God. In the Old Testament, the Spirit's involvement begins with creation. Genesis 1, 2 describes the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, indicating His role in bringing order out of chaos and life into the world. This fundamental moment sets the stage for the Spirit's ongoing creative and sustaining work throughout history. Also, prophetic writings illuminate the Holy Spirit's role, especially in relation to God's redemptive plans. Isaiah 11, 2 speaks of the Spirit resting upon the Messiah, endowing Him with wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. This passage anticipates the New Testament revelation of Jesus Christ, upon whom the Spirit would descend and remain, Matthew 3.16. In Ezekiel 36, 26, 27, God promises to give His people a new heart and spirit, indicating an internal transformation that the Holy Spirit would bring about. This prophecy points to the regenerative work of the Spirit, important to the New Covenant. Joel 2.28, 29 prophecies, a future outpouring of the Spirit on all people. Transcending previous limitations and democratizing access to God's Spirit. An anticipation of the Pentecost event. The New Testament contributes a fuller revelation of the Holy Spirit's work, specifically through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is intricately involved in Jesus' incarnation, as seen in Luke 135, where the angel Gabriel announces that the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary, leading to the conception of Jesus. This divine act asserts the Spirit's creative force and His role in the incarnation of the Son of God. Throughout Jesus' ministry, the Spirit's presence is apparent. In Luke 4.18, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61, 1, 2, declaring that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, anointing him to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover sight for the blind, and release the oppressed. This highlights the Spirit's empowering presence in Jesus' ministry, enabling him to fulfill his messianic mission. The culmination of the Spirit's work in the New Testament is seen in the event of Pentecost as recorded in Acts 2. Here, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the apostles, accomplishing Joel's prophecy and marking the beginning of the New Covenant era. The dramatic manifestations of wind, fire, and speaking in tongues mean the Spirit's arrival and the enabling of the Church for its mission. Peter's sermon explains that this outpouring is an achievement of God's promise, 
indicating the Spirit's role in both individual regeneration and the collective empowerment of the Church. In addition to these central events, the New Testament further delineates the Holy Spirit's roles in the life of believers and the Church. John 14, 16, 17 records Jesus' promise to send another Helper, the Holy Spirit, who will be with believers forever. This maintains the Spirit's ongoing presence and support in the believer's life. Acts 5, 3, 4 illustrates the Spirit's divinity and personhood when Peter confronts Ananias for lying to the Holy Spirit, equating this act with lying to God. This passage affirms the Holy Spirit's full deity and his personal involvement in the life of the Church. Moreover, the Holy Spirit's work is central in the inspiration and illumination of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 states that all Scripture is God-breathed, indicating that the Holy Spirit inspired the biblical authors to write God's words. Furthermore, 2 Peter 1.21 clarifies that prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This constitutional role points out the Spirit's involvement in revealing God's truth and guiding believers in grasping and applying it. Besides, the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in the sanctification of believers. 1 Corinthians 6.11 speaks of believers being washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This reiterates the Spirit's life-changing work in making believers holy and setting them apart for God's purposes. Galatians 5, 22, 23 lists the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, as evidence of the Spirit's work in producing Christ-like character in believers. In summary, the biblical bedrock for the Holy Spirit is rich and all-round, encompassing His role in creation, prophecy, the life and ministry of Jesus, the birth of the Church, the inspiration of Scripture, and the sanctification of believers. This inclusive scriptural witness equips a robust basis for knowing the Holy Spirit's role in Reformed theology, repeating His active presence and work in every aspect of the Christian life. Through this scriptural lens, believers can appreciate the Holy Spirit's indispensable role in God's redemptive plan and His ongoing work in their lives and the life of the Church. Additionally, in systematic theology, the Holy Spirit is recognized as the third person of the Trinity, fully divine and co-equal with the Father and the Son. This crucial belief underlines the Spirit's personhood and divinity, integral to the doctrine of the Trinity. Unlike impersonal forces or abstract influences, the Holy Spirit is a distinct person with intellect, emotions, and will, capable of engaging in personal relationships with believers. This insight is compelling in Reformed theology, which underscores the Spirit's active and personal involvement in the believer's life and the Church. The personhood of the Holy Spirit is clear in numerous biblical passages. In John 14, 16, 17, Jesus promises to send another helper, the Holy Spirit, who will dwell with and in believers. The term helper, Greek parakletos, indicates a personal advocate or counselor, indicating the Spirit's role in furnishing guidance, comfort, and support. Also, Acts 5, 3, 4 confirms the Spirit's personhood and divinity, when Peter rebukes Ananias for lying to the Holy Spirit, equating this with lying to God. Such passages affirm that the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force, but a personal and divine being who interacts with believers. Moreover, systematic theology investigates the various works of the Holy Spirit, categorized broadly into creation and providence, revelation and inspiration, and redemption and sanctification. The Spirit's role in creation and providence is elemental, as seen in Genesis 1, 2, where the Spirit hovers over the waters, bringing order out of chaos. Furthermore, Psalm 104, 30 emphasizes the Spirit's ongoing role in creation, renewing the face of the earth. This creative work accentuates the Spirit's life-giving strength, continually sustaining and renewing creation. In terms of revelation and inspiration, the Holy Spirit is pivotal in conveying God's truth to humanity. 2 Timothy 3.16 declares that all scripture is God-breathed, indicating the Spirit's role in inspiring the biblical authors to write God's words. 2 Peter 1.21 adds that prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, affirming the divine origin of their messages. This inspiration ensures that scripture is authoritative and reliable, giving a sure groundwork for faith and practice. 
In addition, the Spirit's role does not end with inspiration. He illuminates Scripture for believers, enabling them to know and apply its truths. 1 Corinthians 2, 12, 14 explains that the Spirit helps believers understand the things freely given by God, thus making the Word of God living and active in their lives. The Holy Spirit's work in redemption and sanctification is perhaps most intimately experienced by believers. In the process of regeneration, the Spirit imparts new life to the sinner, bringing about the new birth that Jesus speaks of in John 3, 5, 8. Further, Titus 3, 5 elaborates on this, describing the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This transformational act is essential for salvation, demonstrating the beginning of a believer's new life in Christ. Effectual calling, another key concept in Reformed theology, is also attributed to the Holy Spirit. John 6.44 states that no one can come to Jesus unless drawn by the Father, a work accomplished through the Spirit. This calling ensures that God's elect respond in faith to the gospel, securing their salvation. Sanctification, the process by which believers are progressively conformed to the image of Christ, is another deciding aspect of the Spirit's work. 1 Peter 1, 2 mentions the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, asserting the Spirit's role in making believers holy. This process is progressive, as described in 2 Corinthians 3.18, where believers are altered into Christ's image from glory to glory by the Spirit. The Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in believers, as outlined in Galatians 5.22. 23. Fostering virtues such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These attributes are proof of the Spirit's metamorphic work in a believer's life, enabling them to live in a manner that pleases God. Besides, the Holy Spirit plays a basic role in the life of the Church. As the presence of God among His people, the Spirit indwells believers individually and corporately. 1 Corinthians 3.16 states that believers are God's temple, with the Spirit dwelling within them. This indwelling presence ensures that the Church is a living organism, vibrant with the life of God. Additionally, the Spirit bestows various spiritual gifts for the edification of the Church, as described in 1 Corinthians 12. These gifts, which include wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, ascertainment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues, are given for the common good, enabling the Church to function effectively and realize its mission. Moreover, unity and diversity within the body of Christ are maintained by the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 3, 4 exhorts believers to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, acknowledging that there is one body and one Spirit. While the Spirit unites believers, He also distributes diverse gifts, ensuring that each member contributes uniquely to the body's health and growth. This harmonious variety is decisive for the Church's witness and effectiveness in the world. Basically, systematic theology presents a broad view of the Holy Spirit's personhood and work, highlighting His integral role in creation, revelation, redemption, and the life of the Church. The Holy Spirit is not an abstract force, but a personal and divine being, actively involved in every aspect of the believer's life and the Church's ministry. Through His creative, revelatory, regenerative, and sanctifying work, the Spirit continually manifests the presence and power of God, making the realities of the gospel known and experienced in the world. This perception is essential to Reformed theology, which seeks to honor the Holy Spirit's crucial role in God's redemptive plan and the ongoing life of His people. Furthermore, regeneration, known as the new birth, is a central concept in Reformed theology indicating the Holy Spirit's fundamental role in molding a sinner into a new creation in Christ. This divine act is imperative for salvation and features the beginning of the believer's spiritual sojourn. Regeneration is not slightly a moral reformation or an improvement of human nature, but a profound and radical change that the Holy Spirit brings about in the heart of an individual, enabling them to respond to God in faith and obedience. The necessity of regeneration is maintained by Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, 5, 8. Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. This statement points out that natural birth alone is insufficient for spiritual life. 
a second spiritual birth by the Holy Spirit is required. The metaphor of birth indicates a new beginning, a fundamental conversion that only the Spirit can accomplish. This renewal is described as being born again, conveying a new start and a radical change in the believer's nature. In addition, Titus 3, 5 elaborates on this process, describing it as the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This verse reiterates that regeneration is not an act of human will or effort, but a work of the Holy Spirit. The imagery of washing denotes cleansing from sin, while renewal indicates a fresh start, a recreation of the individual. This transformative work is entirely a work of God's grace, repeating the reformed prominence on salvation by grace alone through faith alone. The doctrine of effectual calling is closely related to regeneration and underlines the Spirit's role in drawing individuals to Christ. According to John 6.44, no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them, and this drawing is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Effectual calling is the Spirit's work in which He calls the elect to salvation in such a way that they willingly and freely respond in faith. This calling is effective because it is grounded in God's sovereign will and the Spirit's force to change hearts. The Spirit overcomes the resistance of the sinful human heart, enlightening the mind and enabling the will to embrace Christ as Savior and Lord. The assurance of salvation is another aspect of the Spirit's work in regeneration. Romans 8.16 states that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This internal witness of the Holy Spirit supplies believers with the confidence that they belong to God. This assurance is not based on subjective feelings alone, but on the objective work of the Spirit who ratifies the believer's status as a child of God. The Spirit's testimony reassures believers of their salvation and strengthens their faith, enabling them to live with the certainty that comes from knowing they are secure in God's hands. Further, in the Reformed tradition, the Spirit's work in regeneration is linked to the concept of union with Christ. When the Holy Spirit regenerates an individual, He unites them with Christ making them partakers of all the benefits of Christ's redemptive work. This union is both legal and critical. Legally, believers are justified, declared righteous before God because of Christ's atoning work. Vitally, they receive new spiritual life, being made alive in Christ. This union is indispensable for the believer's identity and the source of their new life in Christ. The life-changing strength of the Holy Spirit in regeneration results in a new creation, as described in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This passage underscores the complete nature of the change that regeneration brings. The old self, typified by sin and separation from God, is replaced by a new self that is created in righteousness and holiness. This new creation is the work of the Holy Spirit, who imparts new life and enables the believer to live in a manner that reflects their new aspect in Christ. The ethical connotations of regeneration are weighty. The regenerated believer is enabled by the Holy Spirit to live a life that is pleasing to God. This new life is distinguished by a shift of desires, attitudes, and behaviors. The fruit of the Spirit, as outlined in Galatians 5, 22, 23, becomes conspicuous in the life of the believer. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are produced by the Spirit's indwelling presence and manifests a life that has been regenerated. This transformation is ongoing, as the Holy Spirit continues to work in the believer's life, sanctifying them and conforming them to the image of Christ. Besides, regeneration has communal indications. As the Holy Spirit regenerates individuals, he incorporates them into the body of Christ, the Church. This incorporation into the community of believers means that regeneration is not only an individual experience, but also a corporate one. The Holy Spirit not only creates new individuals, but also a new community that echoes the Kingdom of God. This community is defined by unity, love, and mutual edification, as believers live out their new life together in fellowship with one another. To sum up, regeneration is a great work of the Holy Spirit that is indispensable for salvation. It involves a radical conversion of the individual, making them a new creation in Christ. This work is initiated by the Spirit's sovereign act of effectual calling, ensuring that the elect respond in faith to the gospel. Additionally, the Spirit's work in regeneration provides assurance of salvation, 
unites the believer with Christ, and produces ethical metamorphosis and communal integration. Through regeneration, the Holy Spirit brings about a new beginning, enabling believers to live out their status as children of God and members of the body of Christ. This integral doctrine emphasizes the need of the Spirit's work in salvation and accentuates the life-changing weight of God's grace in the believer's life. Moreover, sanctification is a crucial aspect of Christian theology and experience, referring to the process by which believers are progressively made holy, conformed to the image of Christ. In Reformed theology, the Holy Spirit is recognized as the primary agent of sanctification, working within believers to reconstruct them into the likeness of Jesus Christ. This work is an ongoing process that begins at regeneration and continues throughout the believer's life, culminating in glorification. The Holy Spirit's role in sanctification is varied, involving both definitive and progressive aspects. Definitive sanctification occurs at the moment of regeneration when the believer is set apart for God and made holy in their position before Him. This initial act is described in 1 Corinthians 6.11, where Paul states that believers are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This positional holiness is a decisive break from the power of sin, recognizing the believer as belonging to God. Progressive sanctification, on the other hand, is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life, enabling them to grow in holiness and Christlikeness. This aspect of sanctification is described in passages such as 2 Corinthians 3.18, which states, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being remodeled into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Here the Spirit is described as actively revamping believers, gradually conforming them to the nature and likeness of Christ. This renewal involves a profound internal change, affecting the believer's thoughts, desires, and actions. The Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of believers, which is evidence of this ongoing sanctification. Galatians 5, 23 lists the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities are not the result of human effort, but are the natural outcome of the Spirit's work within the believer. As believers yield to the Spirit, He cultivates these virtues in their lives, demonstrating the moral and ethical shift that sanctification entails. Furthermore, sanctification by the Holy Spirit involves a battle against sin. While definitive sanctification breaks the dominion of sin, progressive sanctification requires the believer to actively resist sinful desires and behaviors. Romans 8.13 affirms this aspect, stating, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Spirit empowers believers to mortify the deeds of the flesh, enabling them to live in victory over sin. This mortification is a continual process, requiring daily dependence on the Spirit's force and guidance. In addition, the Spirit uses various means to accomplish sanctification in the believer's life. One primary means is the Word of God. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Further, the Holy Spirit, who inspired the scriptures, illuminates them for believers, helping them to learn and apply God's word to their lives. As believers meditate on and obey the scriptures, the Spirit uses this divine truth to renew their minds and transform their lives. Prayer is another essential means of sanctification. The Holy Spirit assists believers in their prayer life, interceding for them according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26, 27 explains, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This intercessory work of the Spirit aligns the believer's heart with God's intentions promoting spiritual development and maturity. Besides, the fellowship of believers is a decisive means of sanctification. The Holy Spirit unites believers into the body of Christ, enabling them to encourage, exhort, and build one another up in faith. Ephesians 4.15, 16 speaks to this communal aspect of sanctification. Instead, 
Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. The Spirit works through the community of believers to promote progress and maturity, asserting the significance of the Church in the sanctification process. Additionally, trials and suffering are tools that the Holy Spirit uses to sanctify believers. James 1, 2, 4 stimulates believers to consider it pure joy when they face trials, knowing that the testing of their faith produces perseverance. The Spirit uses difficult circumstances to refine believers, strengthening their faith and character. Through suffering, believers learn to rely more fully on God and are conformed more closely to the image of Christ, who himself suffered and was perfected through suffering. Hebrews 2.10 In essence, sanctification is an encyclopedic and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. It involves both a definitive aspect, where the believer is set apart for God at regeneration, and a progressive aspect, where the believer grows in holiness and Christlikeness over time. The Holy Spirit is the primary agent of this sanctification, producing the fruit of the Spirit, enabling believers to resist sin, and using means such as the Word of God, prayer, fellowship, and trials to accomplish His work. This process of sanctification is needed for the believer's spiritual advance and maturity, ultimately leading to their glorification when they will be fully conformed to the image of Christ. Through the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work, believers are enabled to live lives that glorify God and mirror His aspect to the world. Also, the Holy Spirit's role in the life of the Church is serious and multidimensional, including the indwelling presence of God, the distribution of spiritual gifts, the promotion of unity, and the empowerment for mission. In Reformed theology, the Church is seen as a community uniquely shaped and sustained by the Holy Spirit. This realization highlights the Spirit's indispensable work in constituting the Church as the body of Christ and enabling it to satisfy its divine mission in the world. The Holy Spirit's indwelling presence is intrinsic to the Church's particularity and function. 1 Corinthians 3.16, 17 states, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. This passage indicates that the Church is not hardly a human institution, but a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's indwelling manifests God's presence among His people, demonstrating them as holy and set apart for His meanings. This presence is both individual and corporate, as the Spirit indwells each believer and the Church collectively, creating a sacred community that reflects God's glory. The distribution of spiritual gifts is another imperative aspect of the Holy Spirit's work in the Church. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 7 explains There are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit bestows a variety of gifts upon believers, each uniquely designed to add to the Church's health and advancement. These gifts include wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. The diversification of gifts echoes the Spirit's creativity and ensures that the Church is equipped to meet various needs and challenges. Importantly, these gifts are given for the common good, pointing out that their aim is to build up the Church and promote its unity and effectiveness. Unity within the body of Christ is a consequential theme in the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit is central to achieving and maintaining this unity. Ephesians 4, 3 6 exhorts believers to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The Spirit creates and sustains the unity of the Church, overcoming barriers of ethnicity, social status, and personal preferences. This unity is not uniformity but a harmonious diversity where each member devotes uniquely to the body's well-being. The Spirit supports this unity by cultivating love, peace, and mutual edification among believers, enabling them to live in community despite their differences. 
The enablement for mission is another essential role of the Holy Spirit in the Church. Acts 1. 8 records Jesus' promise to his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Spirit empowers believers to bear witness to Christ, enabling them to proclaim the gospel boldly and effectively. This enablement includes not only the ability to preach and teach, but also the capacity to perform signs and wonders that authenticate the gospel message. The early church's missionary activity, as described in the book of Acts, is a tribute to the Spirit's force working through believers to spread the gospel and establish new communities of faith. Moreover, the Holy Spirit's role in sanctifying the church is momentous. The Spirit works to purify and mature the church, leading believers into greater holiness and Christ-likeness. Ephesians 5, 25, 27 describes Christ's love for the church and his desire to present it as a radiant bride, holy and blameless. The Spirit accomplishes this sanctifying work through the Word of God, convicting believers of sin, guiding them into truth, and producing the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. This ongoing work of sanctification ensures that the church remains faithful to its calling and reflects God's character in the world. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit advances fellowship and mutual support within the church. Acts 2.42-47 brings a vivid picture of the early church's communal life, described by devotion to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. The Spirit cultivates this sense of community, knitting believers together in love and enabling them to care for one another's needs. This fellowship is a strong witness to the world of the life-changing weight of the gospel and the reality of God's kingdom. In addition, the Spirit plays a basic role in guiding the church in its decision-making and leadership. In Acts 13, 2, 4, the Holy Spirit directs the church in Antioch to set apart Barnabas and Saul for missionary work, demonstrating the Spirit's active involvement in guiding the church's mission and ministry. The Spirit contributes wisdom and determination to church leaders, helping them navigate complex situations and make decisions that align with God's will. In summation, the Holy Spirit's work in the church is exhaustive and transformational, enveloping indwelling presence, distribution of spiritual gifts, promotion of unity, empowerment for mission, sanctification, backing fellowship, and guiding decision-making. The Spirit's indwelling presence indicates the church as a sacred community, while the distribution of gifts equips it for effective ministry. The Spirit's work in promoting unity and championing fellowship creates a harmonious and supportive community, reflecting the love of Christ. Through enablement for mission and guidance in decision-making, the Spirit enables the Church to fulfill its divine calling to proclaim the gospel and advance God's kingdom. In all these ways, the Holy Spirit is the lifeblood of the Church, animating and sustaining it in its mission to glorify God and make disciples of all nations. Further, the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Scripture is major in Reformed theology, encompassing both the inspiration of the biblical texts and the illumination of their truths to believers. The Holy Spirit's role in Scripture ensures that it is authoritative, reliable, and metamorphic, aiding as the ultimate guide for faith and practice. This dual work of the Spirit, both in the creation and the interpretation of Scripture, reiterates the inseparable link between the Spirit and the Word of God. The inspiration of Scripture is the first crucial aspect of the Holy Spirit's work. According to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The term God-breathed, Greek theopneustos, indicates that the scriptures originate from God, with the Holy Spirit as the divine breath or agent of this process. This means that the human authors of the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write God's message, ensuring that their writings were free from error and fully authoritative. Peter reinforces this in 2 Peter 1.21, stating, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This passage repeats the Spirit's active role in guiding the prophets and apostles, ensuring that their messages were not only human ideas, but divinely sanctioned truths. The doctrine of inspiration assures believers that the Bible is trustworthy and authoritative. It is not a collection of human thoughts on the divine, but the very word of God communicated through human authors. This divine human cooperation does not compromise the integrity of the scriptures, 
but rather guarantees that the Bible fully accomplishes God's ambition of showing himself to humanity. The Holy Spirit's inspiration of Scripture is crucial for the Christian faith, equipping a reliable and unchanging standard for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. The Holy Spirit's work in illumination is equally decisive. While inspiration refers to the Spirit's work in the original writing of Scripture, illumination pertains to the Spirit's ongoing work in helping believers perceive and apply Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.12.14 explains this process. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may realize what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. This passage underlines the need of the Holy Spirit for true recognition of spiritual truths. Without the Spirit's illumination, the message of Scripture remains incomprehensible or foolish to the natural mind. The Holy Spirit's illumination is not about imparting new revelation, but about enlightening the mind to grasp and apply the revelation already given in Scripture. This involves opening the eyes of believers to see the beauty and relevance of biblical truths, convicting them of sin, and guiding them into all truth. John 16, 13. The Spirit's role in illumination ensures that Scripture is not a dead letter, but a living and active word that pierces the heart and alters lives. Hebrews 4, 12. This work of illumination makes the Bible personally impactful, as the Spirit applies its truths to the believer's life, cherishing spiritual growth and maturity. The interplay between the Holy Spirit and Scripture is indisputable in how the Word functions within the Church. Ephesians 6.17 describes the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit, indicating that the Scriptures are a primary tool the Spirit uses in spiritual warfare. The Spirit empowers believers to wield this sword effectively, enabling them to resist temptation, combat falsehood, and proclaim the gospel with authority. The Word and the Spirit work in tandem to equip believers for every good work, shaping their thoughts, attitudes, and actions according to God's will. Besides, the Holy Spirit uses Scripture to cultivate unity and purity within the Church. As believers submit to the authority of the Bible, the Spirit guides them into a common understanding of truth, promoting doctrinal unity and harmony. This unity is pivotal for the Church's witness in the world. As Jesus prayed in John 17:17, 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. The Spirit's use of the word sanctifies believers, setting them apart for God's aspirations and making them holy. This sanctifying work ensures that the Church echoes the nature of Christ and exists as a beacon of truth and righteousness in a fallen world. Additionally, the Holy Spirit's role in Scripture extends to the context of preaching and teaching. The Spirit enables preachers and teachers to faithfully proclaim and explain the Word of God. Acts 1. 8 records Jesus' promise of the Spirit's strength for witnessing, which includes the proclamation of the gospel. Paul's ministry exemplifies this, as he relied on the Spirit's power to preach with boldness and clarity. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, 5. The Spirit's anointing on preaching and teaching ensures that the message of Scripture is communicated effectively, penetrating hearts and leading to repentance and faith. In brief, the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Scripture is integral to differentiating the Bible's authority and effectiveness. The Holy Spirit's work in inspiring the Scriptures guarantees their divine origin and reliability, while His role in illumination ensures that believers can figure out and apply God's Word to their lives. This active interaction between the Spirit and the Word equips the Church for its mission, boosts unity and holiness, and empowers believers to live faithfully according to God's disclosed truth. Recognizing the Holy Spirit's indispensable role in Scripture helps believers appreciate the Bible as not just a historical document, but as the living and active Word of God, fundamental for spiritual development and maturity. Also, the cessationist perspective on the Holy Spirit is a considerable theological stance within Reformed theology, underscoring that certain miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased with the apostolic age. This view contrasts with the continuationist view, which holds that all spiritual gifts, including miraculous ones, continue to be available and operative in the Church today. 
Figuring out the cessationist stance involves surveying its biblical basis, theological rationale, and meanings for the life and practice of the Church. Cessationism rests on the belief that the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, such as prophecy, tongues, and healing, helped a specific direction during the paramount period of the Church, especially to authenticate the apostles and their message. Once the apostolic infrastructure was laid and the New Testament canon was completed, these gifts were no longer decisive and hence ceased. A key scriptural passage often cited in support of cessationism is 1 Corinthians 13, 8 10, where Paul states, Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will pass away, as for tongues, they will cease, as for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Cessationists interpret the perfect as the accomplished canon of Scripture or the maturity of the Church, suggesting that the partial and temporary gifts would no longer be needed once this perfection was achieved. Another argument for cessationism is drawn from the unique role of the apostles. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul describes the Church as built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Cessationists contend that the apostles and prophets had a principal role that was unique and unrepeatable. The miraculous gifts they exercised were signs of their apostolic authority and were meant to enact the church. Once this support was laid, the extraordinary gifts associated with their ministry were no longer fundamental. The closing of the apostolic era thus showed the cessation of these gifts. Historically, the cessationist angle has been supported by many key figures in church history. For instance, Augustine of Hippo in the 4th and 5th centuries noted that the age of miracles had passed, suggesting that such extraordinary gifts were no longer noticeable in his time. Similarly, John Calvin in the 16th century debated that the miraculous gifts were temporary and ceased with the death of the last apostles. These historical affirmations bolster the cessationist claim that the extraordinary gifts were specific to the apostolic age and not intended to be normative for the church throughout history. Theologically, cessationists emphasize the sufficiency of Scripture. They dispute that with the achievement of the biblical canon, believers have all they need for faith and practice. The miraculous gifts, notably prophecy and tongues, were imperative before the New Testament was realized to furnish revelation and guidance. Now that the full revelation of God's will is contained in Scripture, there is no need for additional revelations or sign gifts. This view upholds the doctrine of sola scriptura, accentuating that Scripture alone is sufficient for guiding the Church and the believer. The overtones of the cessationist outlook for the life and practice of the Church are meaningful. It leads to a focus on the ordinary means of grace, preaching, teaching, sacraments, and prayer as the primary ways through which the Holy Spirit works in the Church. Rather than seeking after extraordinary manifestations, cessationists embolden believers to grow in faith and holiness through the faithful exposition of Scripture, participation in the sacraments, and prayer. This approach affirms the Spirit's ongoing work in illuminating Scripture, convicting of sin, and producing the fruit of the Spirit in the believer's life. Moreover, Cessationism gives a foundation for evaluating claims of modern miraculous gifts and movements. By asserting that the extraordinary gifts were specific to the apostolic era, cessationists caution against accepting contemporary claims of prophecy, tongues, and healing without rigorous biblical scrutiny. This angle helps protect the Church from potential abuses and errors associated with such claims, urging believers to distinguish the true work of the Spirit through the lens of Scripture. Critics of cessationism often argue that it limits the Spirit's freedom to work as He wills and that it does not account for the ongoing need for spiritual gifts in the Church. Continuationists point to experiences of miraculous gifts and the vitality they bring to the Church as proof that the Spirit continues to bestow these gifts. However, cessationists respond by highlighting the historical and biblical context of the miraculous gifts affirming that the Spirit's primary work is now through the ordinary means of grace. All in all, the cessationist aspect on the Holy Spirit is a well-grounded theological position within Reformed theology, indicating that the miraculous gifts ceased with the apostolic age. This view is supported by scriptural interpretation, historical precedent, 
and theological considerations maintaining the sufficiency of Scripture. While recognizing the Holy Spirit's ongoing work in the Church, cessationists focus on the ordinary means of grace as the primary channels through which the Spirit operates. This prospect supplies a core for grasping the role of spiritual gifts and guides the Church in figuring out the true work of the Holy Spirit in the contemporary world. Last but not least, knowing the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers has thorough practical ramifications. This knowledge not only enriches theological intuitiveness, but also molds everyday Christian living. Recognizing the Holy Spirit's presence and work leads to a richer relationship with God, a more vital spiritual life, and an enabled witness to the world. The Holy Spirit's ministry includes various aspects, including personal sanctification, guidance, empowerment for service, and the cultivation of spiritual fruit, each bearing momentous significances for believers. The Holy Spirit's work in personal sanctification is significant to Christian living. As believers, we are called to live holy lives, depicting the aspect of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the agent of sanctification, continually working to conform us to the image of Christ. This process involves putting to death the deeds of the flesh and cultivating a life that is pleasing to God. Romans 8.13 points out this, stating, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Practical implications include daily reliance on the Spirit for strength to overcome sin and the intentional pursuit of spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, and fellowship. By yielding to the Spirit's metamorphic work, believers grow in holiness and develop Christ-like character. The guidance of the Holy Spirit is another pressing aspect of the believer's life. Jesus promised that the Spirit would guide us into all truth, John 16, 13, leading and directing our steps. This guidance is not simply about major life decisions, but also envelopes daily choices and actions. Believers are heartened to cultivate a sensitivity to the Spirit's leading through prayer and immersion in Scripture. As we seek the Spirit's direction, we learn to perceive His voice and follow His promptings. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 advises, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Practical steps include committing decisions to prayer, seeking godly counsel, and being attentive to the Spirit's conviction and guidance in everyday situations. This reliance on the Holy Spirit feeds a life marked by wisdom and obedience to God's will. Enablement for service is another notable connotation of the Holy Spirit's work in the believer's life. The Spirit bestows spiritual gifts upon believers, equipping them for ministry and service within the body of Christ. These gifts, outlined in passages such as 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, include wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, and leadership, among others. Recognizing and exercising these gifts is important for the edification of the Church and the accomplishment of its mission. Believers are encouraged to label their spiritual gifts and use them to serve others, thereby granting to the progress and health of the church. Ephesians 4.12 reiterates that these gifts are given to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Practically, this involves active involvement in church ministries, volunteering, and seeking opportunities to use one's gifts for the benefit of others. This empowerment by the Spirit ensures that the Church operates effectively and believers achieve their God-given goal. The cultivation of spiritual fruit is another imperative aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry with practical indications for believers. Galatians 5 23 describes the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities reflect the nature of Christ and are evidence of the Spirit's work in the believer's life. Cultivating the fruit of the Spirit involves a conscious effort to walk in the Spirit and allow Him to shape our attitudes and behaviors. This renewal affects all areas of life, including relationships, work, and personal conduct. For example, exhibiting patience and kindness in difficult situations demonstrates the Spirit's influence and witnesses to the transformative weight of the gospel. Practically, believers are called to foment these virtues through intentional practice, prayer for the Spirit's help, and consistent self-inspection to align their lives with God's will. In addition, living by the Spirit impacts the believer's prayer life. The Holy Spirit assists in prayer, interceding for us according to God's will, 
Romans 8, 26, 27. This means that prayer is not solely a human effort, but a divine partnership, where the Spirit helps articulate our strongest needs and align our requests with God's intents. Practical meanings include praying with an awareness of the Spirit's presence, seeking His guidance in prayer, and relying on His intercession when words fail. This dependence on the Spirit broadens the believer's prayer life, making it more fascinating and effective. Further, the Holy Spirit empowers believers to bear witness to the gospel. Acts 1, 8 declares, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This enablement is important for evangelism and mission, enabling believers to share their faith boldly and effectively. Practical steps include seeking opportunities to share the gospel, relying on the Spirit for boldness and clarity, and trusting Him to work in the hearts of those who hear. This empowerment ensures that the believer's witness is not in their own strength, but through the Spirit's force. In a word, learning the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers carries weighty practical overtones. From personal sanctification and guidance to empowerment for service and the cultivation of spiritual fruit, the Holy Spirit's ministry is integral to every aspect of the Christian life. By yielding to the Spirit, seeking His guidance, exercising spiritual gifts, and cultivating His fruit, believers can live reconstructed lives that echo the aspect of Christ and advance the mission of the Church. This reliance on the Holy Spirit ensures that the believer's life is demonstrated by advancement, effectiveness, and an intense, abiding relationship with God. In conclusion, in Reformed theology, the role of the Holy Spirit is both vital and life-changing, deeply influencing every aspect of Christian belief and practice. From the moment of regeneration, where the Spirit imparts new life and begins the process of sanctification, to His ongoing work of guiding, enabling, and sustaining believers, the Holy Spirit is integral to the faith adventure. Through the inspiration and illumination of Scripture, the Spirit ensures that God's Word remains a living and active guide for believers, providing wisdom and awareness for righteous living. The cessationist viewpoint, which supposes that certain miraculous gifts ceased with the apostolic age, repeats the sufficiency of Scripture and the ordinary means of grace as the primary channels of the Spirit's work today. Practical ramifications of perceiving the Holy Spirit's role include a profound reliance on Him for personal holiness, effective ministry, and bold witness to the gospel. The Spirit cultivates the fruit of the Spirit within believers, forwarding Christ-like nature and enabling them to live in a manner that glorifies God. Additionally, the Spirit unites the Church, distributing different gifts for its edification and equipping it for its mission in the world. As believers yield to the Spirit's leading, they experience His transformational power, growing in grace and truth, and becoming effective ambassadors for Christ. Recognizing and accepting the extensive role of the Holy Spirit advances the believer's spiritual life, deepens their relationship with God, and empowers them to realize their calling. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit's work is indispensable, ensuring that believers are continually conformed to the image of Christ and that the Church remains an active and faithful witness to God's redemptive work in the world. This theological knowledge of the Holy Spirit underlines the energetic and crucial nature of His presence and activity in the life of every believer and the Church as a whole.